I think a lot of people, they struggle to engage in some sort of spiritual relationship when A, they don't feel God exists, or B, they feel like the world has been against them for some time. So what, how does somebody begin to do that? Part of the problem is the language that we use. So I grew up in communist Hungary, by the way, you know, as, a, as a kid. You know, And there used to be a joke in Eastern Europe which said that you could be honest and intelligent or a member of the Communist Party. In fact, you could be all two of those things, but you couldn't be all three at the same time. If you're honest and intelligent, you couldn't be a party member. You could be honest and be a party member, but then you wouldn't be very intelligent, and so on. I related the same way to God. So I was told that God was omniscient, omnipotent, and all good. Now, my grandparents died in Auschwitz, and so did I myself, almost. And I said to myself, what kind of a God could be all good and all powerful and all Auschwitz to happen? Well, then God couldn't know everything, could he? Or he could know everything and be all powerful, but then he couldn't be any good. Otherwise, they wouldn't allow these horrors to be perpetrated. So the very idea of God I was hostile to, the way God was presented to me. So part of the problem is the language that we use. I used to be very angry at the idea of God. But the question is, why was I angry? Because I so badly wanted to believe in something greater than myself. And the kind of God they gave me, I couldn't believe in that God. It took me a long time to get past that. And to realize, I still, I still don't have a concept of God as some kind of an entity that's personalized and sitting up there making decisions. That just makes no sense to me. But boy, is it not the case that we're all part of something much greater than we are? That our little egos are just like small manifestations of what's potentially available to us? Isn't it the case that this universe is completely unitary and we have to be, we have to be temporary manifestations of universal dynamics that shows up in this particular form that I inhabit and the particular form that you inhabit, but that's not the be all and the end all of existence. Human beings have a need for that larger connection for that. So actually we're spiritual creatures in that sense. I'm not talking to religion here. I mean, sometimes people find spirituality through their religion. Sometimes religion is a real barrier towards spirituality in the sense of a larger connection, sense of belonging, something greater. When we talk about love, I'm not just talking about sexual love or even personal love. When do we feel more fulfilled? When our hearts are open or when they're closed? There's, things, there's certain things about our nature that call for the spirituality of some kind. How you get there through your religion or through nature or through meditation or through yoga or contemplation or whatever the path happens to be, that's an individual choice. But the sense of belonging to something greater, that's a commonality that we share with all existence. I think that's an essential part of who we are. So when I talk about spirituality, that's what I talk about. And um, in the 12 step groups, when I talk about God, some people can accept that. But some people, it's a little barrier because they came up, grew up in homes where they were beaten over the head in the name of God. You know, So I wish the, the language can be unfortunate sometimes. But behind that language, the sense of a higher power that we're all a part of, the older I get, the more I recognize the reality of that. And I guess while we're on the subject of like 12 steps and we're talking about higher power, spirituality, which we know is, is something like community and spirituality, they're, they're fundamental principles, I think, of people to recover from addiction and trauma. And it seems like there's so much like technology. We, it seems like there's been more progressive thinking with recovery and addiction and more medical advances, but yet I feel like things are getting worse and worse every single year. The numbers go up and up and up. Like, why do you think that things are so bad right now, despite like some of the advances that we've had? Well, I'm really happy to show you. Actually, I got this yesterday. Uh, first, just off the press, the, the myth of normal trauma, illness, and healing in a toxic culture. We live in a toxic culture. So that if you imagine a laboratory Petri dish, which you're growing organisms in a brew. We call that culturing, a culture broth, by the way. That's the technical term. If a large number of organisms in that brew were dying off or getting sick, you'd call that a toxic culture. So well, on the one hand, we're making advances in treatment. The social conditions keep hurting people really badly. My contention is, is that living a culture so out of sync with human needs and which is so traumatizing to so many people on so many different levels, and it's so stressful for people, 
that diseases and addictions and mental health conditions are burgeoning. By the way, if you look at the numbers of the people dying of overdoses or, or the number of kids who are trying to kill themselves or the number of people being diagnosed with depression and anxiety, the number of women being diagnosed with autoimmune disease, these numbers that keep going up and up and up. If you see them as just individual pathology based on genetics, we have no explanation because genes don't change in 10 years or 20 years or 100 years. So if these numbers are going up, it's because there's something going on in the environment. What's going on in the environment is our culture is getting increasingly stressful. So it doesn't matter how, what advances you're making in treatment, as long as the conditions that brew illness, physical and mental, and addictions are continuing to worsen, you're going to get more and more people getting sick. And that's what's going on. But in addition to that, I have to say that specifically when it comes to addiction, or more broadly speaking, medical illnesses in general, our advances are technical, but they're not advances in wisdom. So that most physicians still don't understand trauma. In fact, most physicians don't even get a single lecture on trauma in their training, which is unbelievable. And many addiction programs are still not trauma-informed. They're, 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 they're focused towards getting rid of the behavior, which itself is a useful goal. But unless you deal with the underlying dynamics that drive the behavior, you can expect relapse in large numbers. So we live in a society that's not trauma-informed, we have a legal system, an educational system, a medical system that's ignorant about trauma. And we have social conditions that breed trauma on every level. That's why things are getting worse. Yeah, it's really well said because it's. I feel like sometimes in the addiction community, it's like people just like, all right, just get sober, get into recovery, put the Band-Aid on. I think obviously like getting sober is a great first step. Getting into recovery is an awesome step. Yeah, But I think people have been sold this idea that once you get sober into recovery, that all of a sudden life gets easy and it just doesn't life gets, it gets so much harder because now you don't have that coping mechanism that you had been suppressing things for, for so long. And I know one of the keys to recovering from addiction, recovering from trauma, recovering from some mental health issues is kind of having the goal to bring yourself back whole, which you talk about in your book, The Myth of Normal. And maybe I want to give some people some hope and that they can, if they're listening to this, you know, improve their lives and recover from trauma and recover from addiction. So what steps can somebody take to reestablish some wholeness in their life to help them heal? First of all, you said when people get sober, I make a distinction between abstinence and sobriety. People become abstinent, but that doesn't, they become, it doesn't mean they become sober. Like abstinence is good. It means you're not using something to temporarily escape from yourself. That's good. You're not getting drunk. You're not getting stoned. That's good. But that's not the same as sobriety. Sobriety is a real capacity of conscious presence. So you can become abstinent without being consciously present. That's the first point. The second point is, as you and I have been agreeing in this conversation, the addictions are always a form of coping, of escape. As you just said, when all of a sudden you stop using the addiction, it doesn't mean that all the problems you've been trying to escape have gone away. You've just taken away a powerful coping mechanism for a good reason, because that same coping mechanism was creating more problems for you. That's true. But all that pain, all that turmoil, the lack of inner peace that you're experiencing before you become addicted, is still going to be there. In fact, because you're abstinent now, you're going to really feel them in a way that maybe you've never even felt before. So now you have to work your way through that, to the traumatic source. So it's actually with abstinence that the work actually begins towards sobriety, towards conscious awareness. So that's the journey. Now, recovery, interesting word. I used to be, for a few years, an English teacher, so I pay a lot of attention to language. So what does it mean to recover something? Get back, right? Exactly. Now, what is it that people get back when they recover? Their lives. Yeah, they get back themselves. Right. And you asked for some good news. Here's the good news. If what get they back get back is themselves, it means that the true authentic selves was never destroyed. We lost contact with it as a result of trauma. But because it can never be destroyed, we can regain that contact. So that capacity to reconnect to ourselves, to our true selves, to truly recover ourselves, that's with us as long as we're alive and conscious. So 
I'm totally optimistic about the human capacity for healing. By the way, healing, the word itself, means wholeness, which means that we become whole. All these parts of ourselves that we cut off because of trauma, we can reconnect with our healthy anger, we can reconnect with our love, with our joy, with our sense of meaning and purpose. We can reconnect with our genuine commitment to be in contact with others. All these things are available to us. So trauma doesn't destroy anything. It cuts us off from things that never themselves go away. And recovery is the reclaiming of our whole true selves, available to us always, always, always. And that's the basis of my absolute optimism. That's going to give some people some hope because I think a lot of times people feel like one of the biggest problems, I personally didn't go to AA or NA, and one of my biggest problems with it is that everybody has to identify themselves as an addict or an alcoholic, where I personally think that, do I think that maybe some people just, if they're further down the, the addiction spectrum than others, I think sure, but I think there's a lot of people, most people, that maybe just situationally they got addicted to something, or maybe they used it as a coping strategy, or maybe they had, obviously we talked about trauma and the role that that plays, or their environment, I mean, just a stressful situation at a job, and and then they end up identifying themselves as this addict, and they're told that they're going to be like this the rest of their lives, and they just begin to say, okay, like, what's the point? of even trying to get better? What's the point of even trying to improve my life? I'm, I'm going to be an addict the rest of my life. This is my destiny. I couldn't agree with you more. So I've been to 12-step groups sometimes. I've had non-addictive issues. And there's a value. I mean, I have to confess that what I'm about to say, you know, partly I'm going to completely agree with what you just said, but partly I'm going to push back a bit. When somebody stands up in front of a group and says, I'm so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic, it's a brave step. They're saying... I'm going to stand up in the front of a group of my fellow human beings and acknowledge that I'm engaging in a behavior that's been harmful to myself and to others. I'm going to stand up in front of you, despite whatever shame I feel about it, because I want you to know me and I want you to support me. And I'm not going to deny it anymore. But that's a positive step in itself. However, there's a danger in it. And the danger in it is exactly what you just outlined, which is that you completely identify with a certain behavior and say, I'm an addict. No, you're not an addict. That's not who you are. You're a warm-hearted, loving human being who used a certain addiction as a coping mechanism. That's who you are. But you're much more than that behavior. So that whenever somebody identifies themselves that this is what I am, I'm going to say, no, no, that's not who you are. So if I could possibly outlaw the word addict, I would. What if somebody, every time you use the word addict, instead of addict, you'd have to say, so-and-so, or myself, is or am a human being who suffered so much pain that they use this particular behavior or substance to soothe themselves for a while. What if that's what you had to say every time you wanted to use the word addict? Now you'd have a much more complete picture of a human being. So I agree with you. And don't identify with some behavior that you had to adopt as a coping mechanism, but that doesn't characterize who you really are. There's a danger in that identification. So it's, it's, it's a limitation of who you are and who you ever were. So on the one hand, I see the value in that kind of acknowledgement, but I also see the danger of identifying with that acknowledgement. Actually, I agree with you on both those things. I, I guess I was more trying to emphasize like the latter of what you said about just long-term identifying with that. I mean, trust, I have a lot of friends in the 12-step community. I've been to, to meetings myself, and I do think they are valuable. I do think they are beneficial, but I do think it's flawed in, in some way as well. And I think there's a lot of benefit to reducing the shame and stigma and just owning who you are in that moment and getting in front of a group of people and creating and forming new relationships with those people to recover from addiction, mental health, trauma, and that sort of thing. What's the path back to wholeness? I know you, you said like coming back to ourselves, there's hope for that and we can do that. Like I know you outline, like I think it's four A's in your book, The Myth of Normal, to help people become whole. Like what are those four A's and how can they be used to pe for people to feel like themselves again? Well, the four A's that I list are pretty arbitrary. I could have mentioned more, you know, but they include healthy anger because a lot of people grew up in circumstances when they weren't allowed to experience healthy anger. And healthy anger is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's a boundary defense. If you don't know, like you say you were bullied in school, part of your problem when you were bullied was that you didn't have how to be in touch with, you, with your healthy anger. And the bully can always sense that because the healthy anger is just a boundary defense. 
says, no, you and my space, get out. A lot of kids are socialized out of their healthy anger because of parenting practices that we talked about. So healthy anger is just as, no, really important. It's not the same as rage. It doesn't have to be aggressive. It's a boundary defense. So that's an important A, is the capacity to set boundaries. People who develop autoimmune disease usually have no capacity for healthy anger, or at least their capacity for healthy anger has been suppressed. As the anger that they suppress turns against them, so does the immune system. That's why there's so much autoimmune disease amongst women, by the way. Because in the society, they're told that the woman's anger is unacceptable. I'm not talking about rage, I'm talking about healthy anger. So that's the first A. Another A is agency, the sense of that we are in charge of our lives, that we're the ones to make the decisions. So that even if I go to a doctor with a health issue, ultimately I'm the one that's going to decide what path is right for me. I'll take the advice respectfully, but it's up to me. And the same thing is true in everyday life. Who's in charge of your life? Who's living your life? Authenticity that you and I have already talked about. That's a one, another one of the A's. So there are these various concepts that we adopt and that can help us sleep. I didn't put this into the book, but awareness is an important A of mindful awareness because so much of our functioning, to speak for myself, but most people I know, is, is unconscious. So to be aware of our minds and what arises in our minds is just an important dynamic. So there's lots of pathways to healing. I never say that the ones that I outline is the only one. I think the biggest thing is curiosity towards oneself, the willingness to ask questions, the willingness to let go of ideas that no longer serve us, the commitment to be authentic, the willingness to learn from negative experience or disease can be a great teacher. Addiction can be a great teacher. I mean, let me ask you this. When you consider what you've learned from coping with your addictions and overcoming them, aren't you grateful for the learning that you've been able to acquire? Of course. I wouldn't trade it for anything. So the addiction was your greatest teacher, wasn't it? Yeah. Why do we have to go through such painful experiences, though, to get these lessons? I just wish that, I mean, yeah, obviously I I'm grateful. Otherwise. I wish it was otherwise, you know, the, <laughs> I, 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 in the book, I quote this Greek playwright, Aeschylus, 2,500 years ago, he said that the way the master or God created us, we have to suffer, suffer into truth. And let's face it, suffering is a big wake-up call. Now, I don't recommend that people should suffer to wake up. I'm trying to make people conscious before the suffering happens. But you know, when suffering does come along, it can be can use it as a teacher, not just as an enemy to get rid of. What is this trying to teach me now? So keeping that mind of curiosity open, I think is so essential. I think that's such great wisdom and advice for people as they're trying to bring themselves back to wholeness and specifically like the curiosity part where you're not only like going within and asking yourself certain things, but you're asking for help. You're asking other people that have gone before you and that you admire for advice and help along the way. And my last question for you is this, is that I have a lot of parents that listen to the podcast whose kids or they have a loved one who is suffering from addiction right now. Like what is the most valuable thing that they could know when it comes to loving with somebody who's struggling with addiction? So I know we've been talking about my new book, The Myth of Normal, but for those people that are struggling with addiction in their lives, I also recommend my previous book called The End of Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Ghost Encounters with Addiction. And there I engage with the very question you just asked. So my advice is to parents is that there's three things you can do with a loved one who's addicted. Two of them are sane, one of them is insane. What I don't believe is in tough love. There's either love or there's tough. But love is not tough and tough is not love. So there's three approaches. And I've had so many parents tell me that they're so regret their so-called tough love approaches. But that's the only thing they knew because that's what the experts told them. So there's three approaches parents you can take towards a child who's caught in the throes of addiction. Two of them are sane, as I said. One is insane. It's totally sane. First of all, you have to recognize something. The child's addiction is not an isolated phenomenon. The child's addiction is a manifestation of familial trauma. That child is simply the canary in the mind. They're the sensitive one who's manifesting all the suffering and multi-generational trauma, multi-generational trauma in your family. It's nobody's fault. As a parent, I pass my trauma onto my kids. I'm not saying that proudly, 
but I'm also not saying with, with full of shame anymore. It's just what happened because I didn't know any better. I did my best. You did your best. But if we're carrying trauma, our best includes the transmission of trauma to our kids so that your child's addiction is a manifestation not just of some pathology inside the child, but of a whole family dynamic. So are you willing to look at the whole family? Are you willing to use the child's addiction as a wake-up call for the whole family to engage in examining what happened to all of us here? The child happens to be the sensitive one, but they didn't cause it, it didn't start with them. So a sane approach is to say, I'll come back to this in a moment, but a sane approach is to say, we get it. Right now, your addiction is your attempt to deal with pain in your life, and you seem not to be able to do without it. We get it. We're not going to argue with you. We're not going to try and change you. We wish it was different for you, but we'll love you and accept you no matter what happens for you, and we're going to be there for you. We're not going to be put up with being lied to. We're not going to put up with being stolen from, but we're going to love you, and we're going to be in your lives, and we're not going to try and change you. Because we realize that then change can only come from within yourself. That's a sane approach. Another equally valid approach is to say, sweetheart, we're not going to blame you for your addiction. We know that right now this is what you feel you must do, but it's too painful for us. We can't be around it. We don't know how to handle it. So when you are willing to get some help and so on, please let us know. We'll be there for you. But right now we just can't handle it. Not for because of us, you, because we're not strong enough to handle it. That's honest. You say so lovingly, not with an attempt to manipulate the child, but just that's your truth. That's totally sane. What both approaches have in common is we're not going to try and change you. The third approach is we're going to be in your life and we're going to keep cajoling you and, and inducing you and threatening you and begging you to change. That's insane making. All you're going to do is get more resistance and you're going to make yourself crazy. So either, so both levels, either be with the person and accept them for who they are or accept them for who they are, but not be with them if you can't stand it. But whatever you do, don't put pressure on them to change because whenever there's pressure, there's going to be pushback. Now, interventions. Here's the intervention that I believe in. By the way, in the book, I quote this friend of mine. He's a psychiatrist and he's an American Lakota background. His name is Louis Mel Madrona. And Louis says that in the Lakota tradition, in the Lakota Sioux tradition, when somebody got sick, the community gathered around them and they said, thank you. Your illness manifests some dysfunction in the whole community. You're just showing us some imbalance in our whole community. So your healing is all healing. And that's the kind of intervention I believe in. So the intervention that I believe in is you got this addiction. Thank you. The pain that you're trying to soothe is not just your pain. It's the pain of the whole multi-generational family. And we're going to try and heal that pain. And we invite you to join us. And if you're not ready to join us, that's okay. We're still going to do the work for ourselves. But we'd love it if you did join us in that work. That kind of intervention I believe in. But not just as words, but as actions. In other words, that the family uses the addiction in one individual is a wake-up call to deal with the multi-generational trauma in the whole family. That's a beautiful intervention. So that's my answer to those parents. And believe me, I know how difficult it is to have adult children who are struggling with issues, addiction or otherwise, but for a parent, there's no greater heartache. You have to resist the temptation to try and fix the kid so that you can feel better. I feel like sometimes people think that because they went through a certain experience in their lives, a traumatic experience that it's going to limit them for the rest of their lives. What is your take on that? And do you believe that people should feel like their life is going to be like less than somebody else who maybe didn't have as big of a traumatic experience? Well, I used to have those beliefs about myself. Even after intellectually, I knew better. Emotionally, I was still oriented that way. I wish I could play for you a video that's on my computer. It's from a death row inmate in Texas. This man committed a killing when he was 18. He was um, a troubled teenager, came from a highly traumatizing childhood. His father was electrocuted by accident, his, after which he became very aggressive and violent with the son. Divorce, gangs, the whole thing, and he ended up killing somebody. That was 22 years ago. He's been in death row since. On death row in either Austin or Houston, I forget which, the inmates are in 
cages basically they're not in locked cells. they're in cells but the cells are open cages with all the other death row inmates and these appeals go on for decades as you know and uh, he underwent a transformation he talks about it in this video that he sent me he was used to be addicted he became a meditator he began to learn about his trauma how to heal his trauma he's taken responsibility for what he's done the daughter of the man he killed wrote him a letter saying you got to take responsibility and that woke him up he took responsibility and he also began to understand the sources of his aggression and his drug use and his gang membership you just need to belong somewhere now he teaches kids online about compassion and avoiding drugs and he is an artist he's gonna have an art exhibition open in los angeles next week and he's still facing a death sentence and over the years he's seen many of his friends on death row being put into their death clothes strapped to a gurney and pushed away to their deaths and he loves life and the best he can hope for the best he can hope for if the appeals succeed of which statistically the chances are low the best thing he can hope for is that he'll be his sentence will be commuted to life in jail without a parole for the rest of his life and he says i love life well if you can love life in a cage on death row and be creative and be meditative and contribute to others then who can't now my mind says i can't i know how miserable i get if i stub my little toe you know never mind being on a death row in texas you know but i'm just telling you what's possible that's amazing what an incredible story and it's just so cool to hear how he's completely transformed his life and, you know, I don't know if we talked about this the last time, but it's sad, I think, that we have to go through so many painful moments to experience these positive transformations, right? We, we sometimes don't change things in life until life makes us change it, right? And what do you say to somebody right now who they're just afraid of, like, living in the world that we're in today? Because as you just, we've talked about, it's kind of a hard place to exist in right now, and they've lost hope. They're like, all right, I'm listening to you guys chat and i know that i need to change certain things but what's the point like i feel like the world's against me like how can somebody escape the victim mindset well so if i was talking to a person like that i would say first of all i get it because i've been to that place myself i mean i've had moments when i didn't think life was worth living and i imagined my own suicide never that i planned it or i was going to do it but i kind of fantasized it you know i've been to those places so i get it secondly i would say i feel that the world's against me that's not a feeling it's a belief, okay? If you have that belief, it's because at some point you had that experience. But you're not having that experience right now. That experience was that of a child who was helpless and alone. So what's showing up in your belief system is not your peasant situation, but your childhood emotional experience. And like I said before, in the present we can heal. No matter what happened then, we can heal in the present. So the first thing I would ask a person like that is, are you willing to consider that healing is possible for you? Or have you totally given up? By the way, a person who's totally given up wouldn't be telling you this. Because when people talk this way, whether they know it or not, they're asking for help. If they weren't asking for help, they wouldn't say anything. They just slink off of their own and isolate themselves. And as some people do. So anybody who speaks the way that you just cited is already, whether they know it or not, they're looking for help. And if that's the case, then they can be helped. And so that's the second point is don't try and solve this on your own. We're human beings. We're creatures that evolved in connection and community. You're not alone with this. You may feel like you're alone and you certainly might feel lonely, but you're not in fact alone. Millions feel exactly the same way and they're not crazy and you're not crazy. Those beliefs and feelings are normal responses to abnormal circumstances. So that's how I begin working with the people with a person with that mindset and i guess to take this one step further you know i've heard you talk about like that one of the main problems with society today is that a lot of people who have mental health struggles and they're struggling with situations like this where they feel stuck and they can't get out of their own way at times they feel like people are against them they're dealing with trauma and then they you know they might go see somebody who's not trained in trauma they don't have the experience like how can somebody begin to take that path and make sure that they're finding somebody that is like, you know, trained in that. And then also that they're able to self-regulate themselves when needed. Well, that's a huge question because unfortunately 
Look, I've been through medical training. I'm a physician, and uh, the average physician never hears any of the stuff I just talked about. The average psychiatrist doesn't get any training in trauma. Not in, they learn something about PTSD, which is a specific form of trauma, but they learn they don't learn about the traumatic basis of depression and anxiety and ADHD, and they they, they learn nothing about it. So that it's very difficult to find good help within the medical system. Now, many therapists also don't get any such training. There's a lot of therapists that are designed only to change your beliefs and your behaviors, but not to address the fundamental reasons for those behaviors. So a lot of psychologists trained in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, or dialectical behavioral therapy, a lot of them are not really, and I know this, believe me, I know this, they just don't know much about or anything about trauma. Then they can't help you with the fundamental wound that you're carrying. They can help you with the manifestations. And that's not, that's not useless, but they can't help you heal at your core. So then there are therapies that are deeper than that. There is um, body-based therapies such as somatic experiencing developed by my friend and teacher, Peter, Dr. Peter Levine. There's sensory motor psychotherapy developed by Pat Ogden. There's EMDR that works for some people. There's internal family systems, or IFS, developed by my friend and colleague, Dr. Richard Schwartz. There's Compassionate Inquiry, which is based on my work, and I train therapists in that method. There are others, other names I could mention. There's Larry Heller, Lawrence Heller, and his work and his students. So what you have to look for is somebody who's trauma-informed and is willing to work with you, not just on your behaviors, but on your core wounds of which the behaviors are symptoms. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up because like in my own experience, I mean, I've struggled off and on with my mental health over the years. I mean, I told you a bit about my story in our last conversation. And, you know, when I would go, there wasn't like a lot of talk about my childhood. There was, it was just like, all right, you're having some anxiety. Cool, like here's a pill. And then I would just take it and I would just think, okay, this is going to cure my anxiety. And then I would realize like, it's not really... I'm still getting anxiety. I'm still struggling, like what's going on with this. And it wasn't until I understood like my past and my trauma and how that was all related to what I was experiencing in the present that things were able to change. And so let's just say that, that somebody has now, they found somebody they're comfortable with that's helping them heal their trauma and change their present and their current behaviors and patterns and that sort of thing. And then they go down weeks down the road, months down the road, and they're on the up and up, but get triggered or they experience a situation where they're like, oh my gosh, like I thought I was getting better. Why is this coming up? What's your advice to people who are dealing with triggers when they're on the road to uh, recovery from trauma? Well, there's two ways to ask that question that you just raised. Why is this coming up? Is that a question? What is it actually? What is this teaching me? No. When you say, why is this coming up like that? That's not a question. It's a statement. It's a statement that says, this shouldn't be happening to me, okay? Now you ain't gonna learn anything that way. But if you actually ask it, hmm, I wonder why this is coming up. Now you can learn something. If I came to you and said, why are you doing this? How would that feel to you? I would get, probably get defensive and I would just feel like a little ashamed. Exactly, but what if I said, hmm, I wonder why you're doing this? It would force me to think a little bit and practice the pause and say, well, I don't know if it would force you, but at least they would invite you, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Now, so that's the first point, is, is how should we ask this question? It's a good question, but we have to ask it as a question, not as a statement of resentment or resistance. That's the first point. The second point is use the word trigger. Really great word. Now, if I showed you a rifle with a trigger, how big a part of the rifle is the trigger? It's very small. Very small. For that trigger to set off anything, that what there has to be, there has to be a mechanism to deliver ammunition, there has to be ammunition, there has to be an explosive charge. When I get triggered, let's say you say something to me, and I get triggered, what you said was a very small little thing. I'm the one who's got the explosive charge and the ammunition. You didn't cause me to do that. If I didn't have that ammunition explosive charge, you could say whatever you want. And I just sit here saying, hmm, I wonder why he's saying that. You know, so triggering is a great opportunity to learn. When you get triggered, you could either focus on, resent, and resist the trigger, or you could say, huh, what was I still carrying inside that I haven't looked at yet, that I haven't resolved yet? So if, you know, I used to tell the story, you know, we've been married 53 years now, my wife and I. So let's say 
20 years ago, um, I might ask to sleep with her and she would say no, you know, which is nobody can ever believe that that ever happened, but it did used to happen, you know. And how would I respond? I would respond by going to a rage and curling into a fetal position and not even wanting to live, okay? Now, the trigger is the no that she said. The explosive is my belief that I'm being rejected and abandoned and not wanted and that I'm an infant and helpless, which is what happened to me. Otherwise, if she says no, oh, I can get curious. Are you tired or have I done something to turn you off or is there something you want we can talk about? Or I can just be disappointed and let go of it and say, okay, well, thanks, you know, I'll, there'll be another day. So how I respond is not dependent on the external event. It's dependent on what charge I'm carrying. So triggers are wonderful times to learn about yourself. So if you ask the question, not well, why did I react that way, but, huh, I wonder why I reacted that way. Now, there's a whole lot of learning to be done. So that's what I call compassionate curiosity, where we're actually curious about ourselves, but not in a self-judgmental way, but in a compassionate way. Oh, this brought up the pain of rejection. Obviously, I'm still carrying that, that wound. Well, let's look at that, because it's not happening in the present. I'm glad you brought that up and that we have to change the language and how we talk to ourselves during those moments. Because for me personally, I'm extremely hard on myself. So that like voice that you were saying, like, you know, like, why is this happening or why is it doing this to me? Like, that's something that I've said in my life very, very frequently because of the fact that I'm really hard on myself. I sometimes when something doesn't go my way or when I get triggered or bothered by something, even though I've done a lot of work on myself, I'm, I'm so hard on myself because I'm like, gosh, like I, I'm better than this. I know I should be doing better than this. So that was really eye opening for me. So thanks for sharing that. Well, and you know, that voice in your head that tells you all that stuff. In this book, I actually talk about getting into a relationship with that voice, because this is what I call a stupid friend, you know, because at some point, that voice came along when you were quite small. See, if you were suffering as a kid or things weren't going well, there's two assumptions the child could make unconsciously. One is, the world is dangerous. My parents don't know how to love me, value me. I can't trust anybody. I'm all alone. I'm going to suffer in this world. The other belief unconsciously is, there's something wrong with me, and maybe if I work hard enough, I can fix it. Now, which belief is more protective for the child, do you think? The second one is more protective. Exactly. So it came along as kind of a friend to keep you going. It's a friend. I say it's a stupid friend. The reason I'm joking when I call it stupid, but the stupidity comes in because it doesn't learn that you're no longer that child. It keeps giving you the same message. So my suggestion, Doug, is next time you hear that voice, say hello to it and say, thank you. You know what? Because ask yourself, how old is that voice? I mean, how old were you when it first came along? I mean, I was young because I remember there was this, this idea that I developed about myself from when I was a child that I wasn't good enough because I wasn't picked for sports teams. I got yelled at a lot. So give me an age, five, six, seven. Yeah, I mean, I would say I was in elementary school, I think. But let's call him a seven-year-old. This voice is a seven-year-old kid telling you a story. So say hi to it. Hello, I got it. You're still working to make me better in this world. But you know what? Relax, kid. I can take care of it now. You know, it, it's this... It's just a little immature little friend. That's all it is. It didn't come along to torment you. It came along to actually protect you. Right. And I think you're right. It's so important to have a conversation with that voice and then also change the conversation with that. And then along the lines of like, you know, childhood, one of the things that my audience wanted me to talk to you about more in depth is, is like parenting and that parents are having a hard time right now, I think, with their kids growing up in this world that is hard you're easily distracted you're easily addictive you're easily on your screen all the time like what advice do you have for parents who are, who are raising kids in this world today so that they can you know raise them to the best of their ability it's very difficult to raise kids these days because we're not living in the way that human beings evolved like every animal evolves in a certain environment and context and is suited to that environment and context if you want to understand elephants don't study them in a zoo study them out in a, in a forest or where they live, you know? And human beings, we no longer live in the environments even close to it in which we evolved out there in nature, in small groups connected to each other. Parenting kids was what used to be a group activity. 
It happened in the tribe, in the clan. Parents had lots of support. Kids spent their whole day around their parents. It wasn't goodbye in the morning, hello in the evening, and most of our time is spent away from each other. That would never used to be the case, not to our millions of years and hundreds of thousands of years. Now, we can't go back to that life, you know, and nor would anybody want to necessarily, but we have to understand what we've lost. So first of all, you have to understand a few things, understand a few things. The great Buddhist teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, who died about a year ago, he said that the greatest gift a parent can give to their child is his or her own happiness. So take care of your emotional states because your kid is sensitive enough to be downloading your emotional states and making them their own. So if you're stressed, unhappy, depressed, anxious, addicted, believe me, your kid is going to absorb all that and make it about themselves that there's something wrong with them. So take care of yourself. Live a life that you can live with. And if you get the first three years right, by the way, you got it made. So when your kids are really small, consciously make the first three years as stress-free and as clear of psychological dysfunction as possible. That means work on your traumas. Work on your relationship with your partner, your spouse. That's the first thing. Beginning with pregnancy, by the way, number one. Number two, understand what the needs of children are. Needs of children are for unconditional loving acceptance in the context of a secure relationship where the child doesn't have to work to make their relationship work. The acceptance and the regard should be unconditional. Allow the child to have all their emotions. Whatever the emotions are, let the child have them, understand them. Don't force them to suppress their emotions. I'm not saying be permissive with behaviors. I'm saying don't force the child to suppress their emotions. Don't tell them not to be angry. Don't tell them to cheer up when they're sad. Validate the anger, validate the sadness. These are essential brain circuits for such feelings. Nature gave them to us for a reason. Allow the child to experience them. That way they can stay connected to themselves. Thirdly, There's a need for spontaneous free play out in nature. Get the hell away from these devices. Don't give a one-year-old an iPad or a cell phone. Get rid of the screens in your house when your kids are small. Have a screen in a locked room for yourself if you need one. But don't be phoning and texting and and emailing around your kids because the message they get is the device is more important than they are. Don't go for a walk with them and texting and looking at your cell at the same time. Don't give the kids these devices They've been documentably shown to interfere with the healthy development of brain circuits. This has been shown on brain scans. So if I was raising kids today, I wouldn't let them near a screen for years. On the other hand, I would encourage them to be outdoors, be with them, play with, in nature, spontaneous creative play. So these are the essential needs of children. I talked about them in this book. They're difficult to provide in this culture because if you do any of this stuff, you'll be an outlier because all your friends... And all your kids' friends' parents will be on their cell phones all the time. So you have to make a decision not to buy into the false values of this, what I call this toxic culture. So that's some basic advice, you know, easily said, hard to achieve, but at least these are the goals that we need to be striving for. I wish I had known this stuff when my kids were small. I know that you have been on the forefront of not just like addiction and recovery, but helping people understand that trauma plays a pivotal role not only in people getting addicted to things, but also like healing from trauma to help get not only get into recovery, but thrive in that. And and with that said, like, I know this has been, you've been doing this for years. Like, do you still today with everything going on, like believe that trauma is one of the main contributing factors to addiction? If I can just begin by talking about what addiction is and ask you a question about it, then the answer to your inquiry will emerge, okay? so. Addiction is manifested in any behavior that a person finds temporary relief or pleasure in and therefore craves, but then suffers negative consequences and has difficulty giving up despite the negative consequence. So that's what an addiction is. Okay? Now, so craving pleasure, relief in the short term, harm in the long term, inability to give it up. Now, notice that in my definition, I said nothing about drugs. I said any behavior. So it could be drugs, of course, cocaine, crystal meth, opiates, alcohol, nicotine, caffeine. Could also be sex, gambling, pornography, uh, shopping, eating, work, internet, gaming, just about anything. And the question I always ask people, and I'm going to ask you this now. So you've had your addictions. I don't 
know your personal history, but I don't need to know what it was. What I'm going to ask you is this, not what you're addicted to, but what did it give you in the short term that you wanted? What did you crave about it? Security, numbing of pain, escaping, gave me peace of mind. Okay. Peace of mind, security, numbing of pain. Are those good things or bad things in themselves? Innately, they're, they're good, right? We need those things. Who doesn't want security? Who doesn't want peace of mind? Who doesn't want relief from pain? In other words, the addiction wasn't your primary problem. It wasn't the disease. The addiction was your attempt to solve the problem, the problem of emotional pain, the problem of lack of peace, the lack of security. Then if we ask, well, what is the source of the pain? What is the lack of security all about? Why don't you have peace of mind? We get to trauma. So the fundamental cause of all addictions, and I don't care what they are too, is always trauma that results in us having emotional pain, distress, lack of peace. So my mantra around addiction is not why the addiction, but why the pain. And to understand people's pain, you have to look into their life histories. Not this idea of that you got this genetic disease, which is complete nonsense, it's scientific nonsense. Not this idea that you made some bad choices, because I never met a single person in my medical career or since or before who ever chose to be an addict. The question is, why were you in pain? What did you need to run away from? And that answer is always is rooted in trauma. Yes. <laughs> and I agree with you. And I, I've often said to people that once you get into recovery, like, that's where a lot of the work starts, because now you have to really look at like, why you were using whatever substance or thing in the first place to cope or, or numb pain and begin to find healthier coping mechanisms to heal from that and then like grow into a better version of yourself. If, if you could explain, I guess, for, for maybe people listening to this, that maybe they're not as familiar on the impact of trauma and what it does to our brains and the neuroscience of it, if you could explain to the best of your ability, like how does trauma change our brains? Sure. So first of all, what is trauma? You know, so the, the actual meaning of the word trauma is a wound. That's the, the Greek word for wound or wounding. So, so trauma is a physical or a psychological wounding. So what causes that wounding? Well, what causes that wounding is either when bad things happen that shouldn't have happened, such as happened to a lot of people, says the sexual abuse in childhood, emotional abuse, physical abuse, neglect, an emotionally very unsafe family environment in the midst of a divorce or family conflict, violence in the family, a parent being addicted, a parent being jailed, a parent dying, neglect. These are very wounding experiences for young children, very wounding. But there's another way you can wound people as well, which is not just by doing bad things to them that shouldn't have happened, but by not giving them the needs, not giving them what they need. So children can be wounded by being hurt in the ways that I talked about, but they can also be wounded if their essential needs for human development are not met. A lot of families where there's no overt trauma as such, children are still wounded because they're not seen for who they are, not accepted for who they are, not valued for who they are, when there's pressures on them to be different other than the way they are, that can also wound children. Now, what are the impacts of that? Well, if you understand about the human, look, here's the thing. You can take an acorn, and you can say that it's the nature of the acorn to become a mighty oak tree, which it is. But is that going to happen automatically? If I put that acorn on my desk, will it ever become an oak tree? Never. Because for healthy development of that acorn, certain conditions need to be met. The same thing is true for human development. So for the brain to develop properly, you need the right environment. Now the human brain develops, I'm quoting a scientific article from Harvard now, the human develop, brain develops from conception into adulthood. So brain development begins in the womb, continues into adulthood, and it needs the right conditions. Just like the oak tree needs the right conditions for it to reach its stature. The essential condition for healthy brain development is a non-stressed environment beginning in the womb. So you can stress pregnant animals in the laboratory or pregnant women in real life and their offspring will be more likely to be addicted later on in life. 
because that stress interferes with healthy brain development. I'm talking about still in the womb and then throughout childhood. So the what people don't appreciate that this is just modern brain science is that the circuits in the brain, including the circuits that get involved in addiction, which I can talk about, I won't name them now, but the circuits that get involved in addiction, for them to develop properly, they need an attuned, non-stressed relationship with emotionally present, non-depressed present parents. So when this trauma happens and um, the parents are not able to provide those conditions, those brains don't develop the way they should. In fact, they develop in ways that predispose them to addiction. I'll give you one quick example. Doug, I don't know your personal say, were you ever addicted to opiates at all? That was my thing. I had a three, 400 milligram a day Oxycontin habit. That's what crushed me. Okay, great. Well, let's look at opiates, okay? Why does Oxycontin work in a human brain? Or why do the opiates work in a human brain in general? The opiates work in the human brain because we have receptors for them. In other words, on the surface of our brain cells, like imagine my head is a brain cell, then here's a receptor. A receptor is a molecule where a messenger can fit. So if I have a receptor that looks like this, but there's a messenger chemical that looks like this, there's no fit. If the messenger chemical looks like this, now there's a fit. So we have receptors for opiate molecules on our brain cells. Why do we have receptors for opiate molecules? I mean, opiates come from opium in Afghanistan. Why would I have a receptor for an opiate plant in Afghanistan? I don't. I have receptors for my brain's natural opiates. So we have natural opiates in our bodies. They're called endorphins. Endorphin means endogenous or internal opiate-like substance, morphine-like substance. Why do we have natural receptors for opiates? It's because we have opiate system in our bodies. We manufacture our own opiates. If we understand why you're addicted to, to fentanyl or to oxycontin, an opiate, we have to understand what does the natural opiate do in the human brain? You know what they do? Three things. One is they relieve pain. We already talked about that. They relieve physical and emotional pain. That's why we have endorphins, internal opiates. That's the first thing they do, pain relief. The second thing they do is give us the experience of pleasure and reward, elation, joy. Well, try living life without that. And the third thing they do is the most important, they make possible a little thing called love. Love is the connection between parent and child, the attachment relationship. Without endorphins, that doesn't happen. So endorphins are the love chemical. So when people do endorphins, it's because they have too much pain. I'm sorry, not they do endorphins. When people do opiates, it's because they, they have too much pain in their lives. They need the soothing of the pain. They're lacking pleasure and reward and joy. And they're looking for the warmth of love. And that's why a heroin addicted patient of mine once told me, Doc, when I do heroin, it feels like a warm, soft hug. You know? So in other words, when you tell me that you're an opiate addict, you're telling me that early in your childhood, you didn't have the love you needed, you sustained too much pain, and you lacked pleasure and joy. And when you did that opiate chemical for the first time, you felt like a normal human being for the first time. That's what you just told me. That's my understanding. Right. I agree. I mean, when I first did opiates, it felt like this big warm hug. It felt like this massive weight come off my back that could finally be at peace with who I was. You know, I didn't have to worry about my parents' divorce or I didn't have to worry about being bullied in school. I didn't have to worry about all these traumatic experiences that I had as a teenager. And there's a lot of people that listen to my podcast that they might have kids or they're planning to have kids and they're, they're probably listening to this and they're like, holy crap, like... Is there anything I can do right now to, you know, in my parenting style or in preparation for parenting to help prevent my kid from getting addicted to something or from experiencing some sort of childhood trauma that will impact them in, in adulthood? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So in my book on addiction, which is entitled In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, I have an appendix on the prevention of drug addiction. And the prevention of addiction is not telling kids that drugs are bad. The reason is, is because the kids that listen to adults are not at risk, and the kids who are at risk don't listen to adults. So the prevention has to actually be in the womb. So we got to start with pregnant women, because already these circuits are being potentiated in the womb. So you have to start with pregnant women and say, what are the stresses in your life? What's your relationship like? How much support are you getting? Because you want to create a peaceful environment in the womb for that infant already. 
the second thing I say to parents is work on your own issues. Because any traumas that you haven't worked out in yourself, almost inevitably, you're going to pass it on to your kids, like I did. You know, these things that I'm talking about now, I didn't know them when I was a young parent. And there was significant traumas that my wife had, that I had, that we haven't even realized yet. So that it's almost inevitable that parents who are not conscious will pass on their traumas to their kids. So work on your own issues. Really important. Number three, children have certain needs. In my new book, The Myth of Normal, I have a chapter on the irreducible needs of children. Those needs include unconditional loving acceptance, the capacity to experience all their emotions, whether they're anger or joy or pain. Those emotions need to be received. In other words, the question you have to start off with as a parent is, what are the needs that my children have for health development? Both in this book, The Myth of Normal, and in a previous parenting book I wrote called Hold On To Your Kids, you have to start off not with what do we want our kids to be or how do we want them to behave, but what are their needs for healthy development? And in this modern society, parents are really challenged to meet those needs. That makes a lot of sense. And I think, so I guess what you're saying is like if a kid is screaming when it's mad or it's upset, a lot of times parents will take something away from them or put the kid in timeout. I guess what you're trying to say is that that in itself could be something that could be detrimental to their emotional development. Absolutely. I'm saying that. Let's imagine you're an adult in a relationship. Right. And what if your partner's partner said to you, every time you feel anger, I'm going to make you go to your room and sit by yourself. How would that feel to you as an adult? You know, I, yeah. now, now as a child, you're completely dependent on the parent. And in fact, you have this absolute need to belong to the parent and to be close to them, to be attached to them. When we say to a child, if you're angry, you have to separate from me. What you're saying to the child is, if you have a f genuine feeling like anger, you can't have the relationship with me. I'm going to deprive you of what you need. In other words, we create a fear-based relationship with the child. No child develops properly under conditions of fear. And there's some very famous psychologists who counsel parents to separate. This whole idea of timeout is a toxic practice. If the punitive timeout, actually when a child is really upset, you know what they need? They need time in. They need to be held and, oh, you're really angry, aren't you? Yes, I am. You know, you must be really upset. Yeah. You know, they need to be heard and held. Now, I'm not saying we put up with kids hitting their siblings. I'm not talking about permissive parenting. I'm talking about parenting that's attuned to the child. And so the, the more connection you have with the child, by the way, the more the child will want to do what you want them to do. But essentially, I'm talking about parenting where there's nothing the child can do to threaten the relationship. And every time I punish a child, a two-year-old doesn't know why. They doesn't know why they're doing what they're doing. They're just doing what they're doing. They don't know intentional. There's no intentional circuits up there yet. So when we punish them, they don't know why we're punishing them. All we know is that they're not acceptable to us. So it's when the child is most upset that they most need you. And they most need your understanding. Right. And there's going to be some people, I think, listening to this that they're familiar with trauma in the sense of like severe things happening to them, whether it was some form of, form of assault, maybe it was some form of violence, accident, like a death in the family at a young age, like whatever it was. And now they're hearing what you're talking about. And they might say, huh, like maybe, maybe I have experienced some of this, but maybe they're a bit older and it's been some time since these things happen. What are some signs or symptoms like in adulthood that maybe somebody needs to go back and look into some of their trauma and heal from it? Well, it's very common for adults to recognize that something isn't working and therefore go back and, well, what happened here? That was my case. You know, I was a, I was a successful medical doctor. I had children. I was married. I was a respected member of the community, but I wasn't happy. I was depressed. And my children were actually afraid of me. And I had to ask myself, well, what's going on here? You know, so trauma, what we have to understand here is that trauma is not what happened to you. That's not what the trauma is. So trauma wasn't that there was neglect or divorce or bullying or abuse. That's not the trauma. That's the traumatic event. 
the trauma is the wound that you sustained as a result. So I'll give you a very personal example. When I was a year old, my mother gave me to a total stranger in the street to save my life. This was in Budapest, Hungary, Second World War. So I didn't see my mom, excuse me, for five or six weeks. That was a traumatic event. The trauma was the wound that I came to believe that I wasn't wanted. When your mother gives you to a stranger and you don't see her for five or six weeks, what else can you conclude as a one-year-old that you're not wanted, you're not lovable? Natural conclusion for the child. The wound was not that I was given to the stranger. The wound was the impact, what happened inside me, that I wasn't lovable. So 40 years later, 35 years later, I'm a parent, but I don't believe I'm lovable. So I become a workaholic doctor. So people will love me. I'm always available, day or night, beepers always on, delivering babies, going to emergency wards, looking after dying people. Because I'm still trying to prove to myself that I'm lovable, that my life is worth something. What is the impact of my children? Daddy's always busy, he's never available. Work is more important to him. The impact on my children is they get the message, they're not lovable. So at some point, you have to start asking yourself, why am I behaving the way I'm behaving? When my partner doesn't look at me the right way, why do I feel so hurt? When the work that I'm doing is not satisfying me, why am I doing work that doesn't satisfy me? When I get an illness, like sometimes disease wakes people up. If I get an autoimmune disease, which women, by the way, get in much higher numbers than men do, we can talk about why. Or when I get depression, or let's say I have an addiction, what am I trying to run away from? So usually we have to suffer a little bit, or a lot actually, before we start asking the right questions. That's, I wish we weren't like that as human beings, but you know what? I was like that. I didn't start asking the right questions until I realized I was suffering and I was creating suffering for others. Why? That's when the exploration begins. A lot of people are struggling right now. So many people. I'm getting texts from friends that are struggling. I'm getting texts from friends who have friends who are struggling. And so many people, they just don't know what to do. Like there's this world that we live in that there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of sadness. And I think people are having trouble just coping, you know, in day-to-day life. So, you know, what is your advice for somebody who's listening to this, who is one of these people who is in a lot of pain mentally and emotionally, and they're just having trouble coping with life? Well, First of all, I I totally understand what you're saying, and I see the same thing myself, and the statistics show the same thing. So even the rate of childhood suicide is going up in the States, particularly, you know, more people are being medicated, diagnosed with all kinds of mental health conditions. Something's going on. Well, I think before we, it's a very typically American thing to do is what are we going to do about this, you know? But really the first question is, how are we going to understand this? because what we do will arise from how we understand something. And um, if you take your car to a mechanic, the first thing to ask, he's gonna ask is not, what am I gonna do about this, but how will I understand this problem? Which part of the mechanism is dysfunctioning here, you know? And so the first thing to realize is that the anxiety, the pain, the distress, the depression, the alienation that people are experiencing, they're not the problem. They're the manifestations of a problem. Actually, they're signs. If I experience anxiety or depression, that's a sign from my body and my mind telling me there's something out of alignment in my life. So it's not a question of how do I get rid of depression. I mean, we want to, for sure, recover from it. But in order to do so, we have to say, well, what is this telling me about how I live my life? And what do I need to change? So that's, so in other words, we see these conditions or these mind states as signs. And then we have to say, well, what is it signaling? That's the first point. The second point is, just as your question implies, these can't be individual problems. I mean, if it was happening to the isolated individual here or there, occasionally we'd say, well, maybe it's an individual issue, but when it's happening on a large scale, it's gotta be something cultural. It's gotta be something that's happening in a society that's driving so many people to literally driving them to despair you know and that's the topic i discussed in my book the myth of normal uh, about which i think i was on your podcast before to talk about that so what we're looking is a cultural problem here and the cultural problem we're looking at is that this society stresses a lot of people now if you look at the sources of stress in the scientific literature 
the major triggers for the stress response are uncertainty, lack of information, loss of control, and conflict. Now, uncertainty, lack of information, loss of control, and conflict. I think I've just described this culture. How many people lack a sense of agency and control in their lives? I'm going to give you a trivial example. When uh, Elon Musk buys Twitter, and overnight he fires 7,500 people, and he tells the other 7,500, you can show up to work, but you're going to work harder and longer. That's 15,000 people multiplied by them and their families. That's about 40,000 people probably being affected by the decision of one guy. Well, talk about loss of control. You don't control whether you work or not, and you don't control the conditions of your work. That's a major source of stress for people. The uncertainty of what's going to happen next. The United States, richest country in the history of the world, more than half the population lives two paychecks away from bankruptcy. I mean, talk about uncertainty. And then there's all the traumas that people are carrying that, you know, what happened to them as children and the lack of secure attachments and acceptance for who they were, the need to fit in, the constant competition. These are conditions that could be almost designed to make people anxious and depressed and hostile and um, very insecure. So you're asking what to do. Well, the first thing to realize is there's nothing wrong with you. Your depressions, your anxieties, they're normal responses to an abnormal situation. So don't take it personally. Don't take on shame. Don't think there's something wrong with you. And then secondly, given that so much of it has to do with loss of control and uncertainty, look at your life and see where in your life does uncertainty and lack of information and loss of control show up. Look at every aspect of it, whether it's in your personal relationships or your work or whatever you're doing. And what can you do to gain some agency? And if you can't gain agency because of your circumstances, then at least understand that this is how it is and you have to adjust to it. But don't think that there's something wrong with you. Now, there are more specific things that I can suggest, but the beginning has to do with an understanding that it didn't start with you and there's nothing wrong with you and you have to look at the whole context of your life, not just try and get rid of a symptom. Thanks for explaining it in the way that you did because that makes so much sense. And you're right, like a lot of times, you know, people are just struggling from something in their past or they're just struggling from things that they can't control as a result of what's going on around them. And I think sometimes we need to be able to be like proactive and kind of play chess, if you will, so that we can kind of do our best to stay one step ahead. And, you know, regarding the fact that in a way, like the world is kind of set up for us to become more disconnected, for us to become addicted, for us to become stressed. How can somebody begin to take some sort of control over their lives on a day-to-day -day basis so that they can make the most of this? Because it's not like, you know, we're going to be able to change the world overnight. No, unfortunately, we can't. Well, let's take the problems that you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned addiction. Okay. So if you do have an addiction, rather than seeing it, whether it's to sex or gambling or pornography or to substances or to alcohol or whatever, or shopping or eating, or first of all, ask yourself, not what's wrong with the addiction, and I don't know whether we talked about this last time or not, but ask yourself, not what's wrong with the addiction, what's right about it? What's it doing for me? And most people will say, it soothes me or it numbs me or it gives me stress relief or it gives me a sense of control. In other words, recognize that the addiction is not your primary problem. It's your attempt to solve a problem, the problem of emotional pain, of emotional loss, of stress, and so on. So rather than making yourself wrong for the addiction, ask yourself, well, where have I lost control? Why do I have so much emotional pain? What happened to me? Why am I living under so much stress? So begin with, again, actually looking at each of these problems in context. Rather than making isolated problems out of them, look at them in context. Now, when it comes to stress, there are, broadly speaking, two kinds of stresses. I mean, you can look at stress in a whole number of ways, but one way to look at this is as follows. There are stresses that life brings your way that you can't do much about. You know, if where you live there's going to be a tornado, there's going to be a tornado. There's nothing you can do to prevent a tornado. You could, in the long term, move to some part of the world where there are no tornadoes or less chance, but most people don't have that kind of options. So some things we can't do much about. At least in the immediate sense, 
you can't control inflation. I mean, the government could, and those that have the economic power could, but they have no interest in doing so. You know, that's all about the story. But you can't. So there's some stresses there's not much you can do about. It. Although you could become politically active and see if you can affect the system. That's all the question. But then there's a whole lot of stresses that we generate for ourselves. And those stresses that we generate from ourselves have, broadly speaking, two sources. Well, let's give you an example. Let's say I'm supposed to be on this podcast with you. But let's say the link didn't work. I could say the link didn't work too bad. We'll try again some next, some other day. Or I could get all upset about it. It's so frustrating. One more time, it didn't work. What's wrong with this technology? And I'm going to miss this opportunity to publicize my book. And what's that going to mean? And, you know, I really wanted to express my opinions. And I know he's going to, in other words, I could make a whole story out of it. And that would really stress me, you know? Now, look at the stories that you're making up when stuff happens. Because it's not what happens that stresses you. In this case, there's nothing particularly stressful about a podcast being technologically impaired, you know, or, or delayed. But if I make a big story around it, and it's, you know, it's an exaggerated one I'm presenting you here, but if I make up a big story around it, I'm really going to stress myself. So we stress ourselves by the stories that we tell ourselves. You know, a friend of yours says, let's go for coffee, and then they cancel. Well, you could make up a story that I'm not lovable, or they don't love me, or they're undependable, and why is everybody like that, and why is this always happening to me, you know? That would really stress you. Or you could say, you could say too bad, I'll just get on with my day. So a lot of the stress is the stories that our minds make up around events that happen, and those stories are rooted in trauma. Because if you get upset because your friend didn't show up for coffee, it's because you had some abandonment in childhood, and you still have that wound. So one way to de-stress is to deal with our traumas. Now, the second source of stress that we make up is the stuff that we take on because we don't say no. And I do talk about this in the book, The Myth of Normal, quite a bit, that, that some people grow up believing that if they say no to others' demands, expectations, then they're selfish or then they won't be liked, they're not lovable, they have to earn the world's respect, they have to earn the world's validation, so they don't say no, they take on too much, and that really stresses them. So one of the exercises I recommend is that you ask yourself, where am I not saying no? But there's a no that wants to be said, but I'm not saying it. That's how the exercise begins. Now it's got five other questions. But once a week, sit down and ask yourself, where this week did I not say no, where a no wanted to be said, but I didn't utter it because I was afraid to. And that usually shows up in two aspects of life, work and personal relationships. And that no that you don't say. Like if I asked you, Doug, has it happened to you ever that you wanted to say no, you didn't feel like doing something, but you said yes anyway? Oh, yeah, a lot. <laughs> What's the impact on you when you do that? I get overwhelmed. I get stressed. I feel like ashamed because I'm like, why did I say yes to something that I knew I didn't want to do? I mean, exactly. So the impact is pretty huge, you know, of not saying no. And then if I ask you, well, what's the belief behind me not saying no? Like if I say no, then what? What's the story there? I mean, the story is, are they going to be mad at me? Or, you know, why aren't I capable of fitting more into my schedule? I mean, it's all like a lack of self-worth. Exactly. Which goes back to childhood. Okay. So over the things that we can control, the stories that we tell ourselves and where we don't say no, those are big. If we learn how to deal with them, those would be huge mitigators of the stress that we live under. And again, some stresses, you know, oh my gosh, there was an article in the New York Times just this last weekend about what happens to black mothers and children around birth. And they do a lot worse. Rich black women do worse than poor white women. They're more likely to die. Their babies are more likely to die. And they didn't cause that. That's the stress of racism. And not just around birth itself, but lifelong, because lifelong racism affects the physiology of the body. Now, those are stresses that nobody caused for themselves. If they get enough support and heal, they could possibly resist the effects of that kind of stress. But the stress is coming from a society that is fundamentally still suffused with racism. Well, that you didn't cause. If you're a black person, you didn't cause the racism. 
You know, if you're a white person, you didn't cause the racism either. You inherited it. You know, it's part of the culture. So some stresses are social ones, and we have to deal with them on the social level. But on the personal level, like, now you, I know that you have an interest in men's health, for example. So men, the belief that I have to be strong and invulnerable, and I must never talk about my feelings. And before this interview began, you and I mentioned the the rising and gender unequal rate of suicide. So men are more likely to commit suicide. Men are also more likely to commit violence against women. So there's something about the way this culture programs men that encourages aggression, either against the self or against other people. That's not the fault of individual men, nor is it an issue of biological gender. There's no genes for suicide. Why would there be? You know, Nor is there a gene for violence against women. Why would there be? But if people become depressed, and for example, in the United States, two economists wrote a book about what they call deaths of despair. One of them was a Nobel Prize winning economist. And um, what's happened is that in the industrial heartland of the United States, where industrial jobs evaporated over a couple of decades, they were exported basically to countries where there's cheaper labor. So that the well-paying, reasonably well-paying, unionized jobs and job security and sense of purpose and meaning and belonging of men all of a sudden was taken away from them. That wasn't their fault. But belonging and contributing and having a sense of meaning and purpose are essential human needs. So when all of a sudden that's taken away from men and now they can't provide for their families the way they used to be able to, their sense of own value diminishes. Now they're more likely to become addicted and try and soothe their pain through substances. So you have this high rate of overdose deaths. In the United States last year, over 100,000 people overdosed. Almost twice as many people overdosed in the States as Americans who died in the Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghan wars put together in one year. Now, there's a reason for that. The reason isn't an individual one. It's a social one. It's a society that takes away a sense of meaning, purpose, and belonging from people, which leaves them in despair. Now they're going to escape into addictions or kill themselves. And these have been called deaths of despair. Wow, that's wild. Thank you for sharing all that. And in regards to like all of what you just described, you know, like how we put stress on ourselves, addiction, mental health, a lot of it, like you said, comes back to healing some of the trauma that has happened in our lives. And then also unlearning some of these unhealthy patterns and behaviors that we have experienced as a result of the trauma. And my question is to you is that I think sometimes people get so stuck in their in healing their past and that becomes like the main focus of their life that they don't focus on the future at all, which is what they really need to work on to better themselves. Actually, no, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so this is the book, The Myth of Normal, okay? Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. It's 15 weeks now on the New York Times bestsellers list. The point I'm making in this book is everything I've just said is in the book, but it's not a question of working on the future or the past. It's working on the present because here's the deal. Trauma is not what happened to us. Trauma is what happened inside us as a result of what happened to us. So for reasons I explain in the book, I got the message in the first year of my life that I wasn't wanted. Okay? The trauma is not the war and the genocide amidst which I spent my first year. That wasn't the trauma. Those were the traumatic events. The trauma was the wound, which is in my belief that I wasn't wanted and I'm not worthy. That's the trauma. But that's the good news. Because if the trauma was what happened to me, that was 78 years ago. It's over and done with. I can't change the past. I'll never not have been born as a Jewish infant under Nazi occupation. That'll never not have happened. Whatever happened to you, that'll never not have happened. But if the trauma is my belief that I'm not worthy, I can heal that in the present. And healing the present, so it's not a question of changing the past, it's a question of changing your relationship to the past in the present moment. So, I could be embittered, and believe me, I have been, about the death of my grandparents in Auschwitz. I could be embittered about my infancy, and believe me, I have been, or I could be damn grateful that I survived and have been able to pursue work and relationships that have been so meaningful to me. But it all depends on which angle I'm looking at it from. As long as I'm looking at it from a traumatic angle 
I'm just embittered and despondent. I can't change the past, but I can change the present. Now, needless to say, I'm not giving you a formula. I'm just telling you my personal story. If I could look at it in this world, and on a bad day, by the way, I still don't, but if, but if I can look at this world as a world in which there's a place for me, in which I can find meaning and love, my future is very different. So it's the present we need to work on. We need to work on what beliefs and body states do we hold in the present that limit us. If we deal with that present, the future will take care of itself. I know one of the things that you talk about in your new book, The Myth of Normal, is that people, when they can't manage their their stress or manage their emotions, it ends up like playing out in their physical health and in their biology. Like if you could explain that, I think people would really appreciate it. The first thing is I just want to reinforce your comment that recognizing the original source of things is not the same as working through. Yeah, I can. I, I know what happened to me as a one-year-old. I was given to the stranger and all that. But knowing that intellectually and coming to a state of self-acceptance and self-love are not the same thing. I just want to emphasize the importance of what you said there. Now, in terms of the question about, here's the thing that as a physician, I've had to recognize over time because nobody taught it to me in medical school. And here's the problem that's almost, people find it hard to grasp this, this truth. Ancient wisdom has always known that the mind and the body can't be separated, that what happens emotionally has an impact physiologically. Traditional wisdom, traditional medicinal practices have always known that. Not only has traditional wisdom always known that, modern science has proved it over and over and over again. It's thousands of research papers now, multiple thousands, showing the unity of mind and body, that when emotional factors play up in a person's life, that'll have an impact on their physiology. But unfortunately, neither the ancient wisdom nor the modern science is taught in medical schools. So most physicians get educated into a view of health that separates the mind from the body. This is in the face of all the evidence. Now we can talk about why, but that's just how it is. So that means when I'm lecturing to several hundred people, I'll ask them, in the last five years, have you been to a gastroenterologist, a neurologist, a cardiologist, a rheumatologist, an immunologist, endocrinologist, any kind of an ologist, put your hand up. Well, many people will put their hands up. Then I'll say, keep your hand up if they ask you about childhood trauma, if they ask you about how you feel about yourself as a human being, if they ask you about stresses on the job, if they ask you about stresses in your relationship, almost no hands stay up. And yet those factors of stress and trauma have everything to do with why most people have to go to doctors with their diseases because a lot of chronic illnesses, not all of them, but a lot of chronic illnesses are actually rooted in emotional dynamics based in childhood trauma. And again, that sounds like a mouthful and this guy's making some wild statement. All I can tell you is that there's a whole raft of medical evidence for that. In fact, there's no evidence showing the other way so that the emotional centers in the brain are part of the same apparatus that manufactures hormones, runs the immune system, the nervous system, and the gut. And there's a whole new science that studies the multiple connections between these various parts of that unitary system. So naturally, when you're emotionally repressed, emotionally traumatized, that's going to have an impact on your physiology. So when I deal with people with chronic illnesses, I don't just try and deal with the physical symptoms or deal with the medications they might need, but also what's going on for them emotionally. Because as people emotionally heal, very often their diseases can get better naturally, which is what you expect. Yeah. I've definitely noticed that when I'm super stressed out or I've been in a relationship that wasn't serving me, I've just seen it play out. Not just my mental health, my physical health too, where I almost, you almost get sick and you like take your temperature and you have no temperature. And this is, again, this is all like anecdotal. This is just my experience. You take your temperature, no temperature. You could go to the doctor and they, they ask you if you have something going on and you're like telling them your symptoms, but they don't find anything. And it comes back to just being just super like stressed out. And I'm fortunate that I've been able to get on the other side of that and establish 
some healthier coping mechanisms when I hit adversity because adversity is always going to come. So that way I don't downward spiral. But there's a lot of people, Dr. Mate, that don't because it's challenging when things are stressful and you're emotional to to learn and engage in new healthy coping mechanisms. Like what advice do you have for somebody that is trying to change the way they manage their stress and, and start to heal from some of these wounds that they have so that their overall health can improve? Well, my general sense is that illnesses and symptoms come along as the body's way of saying no, because you're not, to uh, saying no to a stressful situation, to a relationship, which isn't working. The job is not very good for you. So in a new book, I talk about before the body says no, just check in with yourself regularly. What am I not saying no to? What am I taking on that I don't really want to? And why don't I say no? Like a simple thing. I'm in Baltimore and I call you up and, hey, do you want to go for coffee? But you're tired. You haven't slept all night. You don't want to go for coffee. But you say yes because you don't know how to say no because you're afraid that I won't like you or that you owe it to me or something. So you say yes. Well, if you chronically do that, what's the impact on you? The impact is you're always going to be tired and you're going to be resentful. And so I ask people, ask themselves, where am I not saying no? But there's a no that wants to be said, but you're not saying it. And what's the belief that has you not saying no? So if I ask you to go out for coffee, even though you don't feel like it, you don't even like coffee, you're tired, you know, you have other things to do, but you say, yes, I will. There's a story behind that. The story behind it, it's my responsibility to feel gab or feel good. You know, in other words, you're taking responsibility for, for my emotional states. Well, that's the story. Where did you learn that? Oh, I learned that when I was a kid, when I was made to take responsibility for what my parents felt. So there's some very simple ways. The, the, the key dynamic for me, are people being authentic? Are they being true to themselves? The less true we are to ourselves, the more sick we get. And I know people with multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis, and I talk about this in the book, who when they get a flare-up, instead of panicking and running to the doctor, they say, oh, what is this trying to tell me right now? And they actually use the disease as their teacher of how was I not being authentic? They may or may not take medication. I'm not, of course, as a physician, I'm not against medications. But in addition to that, they do an inventory. How is that not being authentic? What stresses did I take on? And they find that the more they understand that, the milder their illness becomes. Because once they learn how to say no, the body doesn't have to. I think the example that you used with me and like us getting coffee goes back to something I know you talk about in the book, which is like the importance of remaining authentic to yourself. And when you're out of alignment with that, it can often lead to a variety of problems in, in people's lives. But there's also this other thing that exists in that dance with authenticity, which is attachment. And we, we kind of need both. And I think sometimes people struggle in that they completely lose themselves to fit in with other crowds, to fit in with other people, to mold into that relationship, to feel attached. Or the other way is they just remain so hard-headed that they don't want to like compromise or embrace any change to be part of a group. So what's your advice to have for people to have a healthy relationship with attachment while remaining authentic? So you're quite right. As, as human beings, um, we need contact and connection. That's our nature. The capitalist myth that we're individualistic, aggressive, competitive, selfish creatures is got nothing to do with reality. How we evolved over millions of years Whereas collaborative communal creatures. And so we have a need for attachment. And quite apart from that, the young child and the infant cannot even live in the absence of attachment. I mean, no child, no bear cub, no puppy dog, no kitten, no baby penguin can survive without attachment relationship with adults. Because they, we need them to nourish us, to protect us, to keep us warm and so on. So in childhood, the need for attachment is absolutely non-negotiable. But as you imply, we also have the need to be ourselves. Now, the need to be ourselves is also a survival need, by the way, because what does it mean to be ourselves, to be authentic? It means to be in touch with our feelings, 
and to be able to act on them. Now, out there in nature, where we evolved for millions of years, how long do you survive if you're not in touch with your gut feelings? Not very long. <laughs> not very long. So that authenticity is not a luxury. It's also built in need. But what happens to a small child where, let's say they have experienced anger because they're two years old and they're frustrated, so they're, they're angry, but mom and dad, oh, angry, get away from us. Time out. Now the child's brain has a decision to make. I could be authentic and experience my anger and lose my attachment relationship, or I can fit into the attachment relationship by suppressing part of who I am, give up my authenticity. Now in every case, the child is not a choice. The attachment is absolute. So the child will be pushed on parts of themselves, their authenticity, they lose contact with themselves. The essence of trauma is loss of contact with yourself. Then we spend all our lives. So now as an adult, we still have a fear of authenticity because if we're authentic, we might lose our attachments. The difference is that you and I and our listeners as adults are no longer children. It's no longer such a tragic dilemma. So if I call you up for coffee and you say no, I might say, I don't want to talk to Doug ever again, but you can survive, can't you? You don't need that attachment relationship with me anymore. You need your authenticity much more than you need me. But if you're still running along the program that you developed as a child, you will suppress yourself. Oh, if I say no, Gabor won't like me. And so you suppress your own authentic impulse in order to be accepted and attached to with me. A lot of people face that problem. And all I can say is it's a painful one. Because if you're going to be authentic, you might lose some relationships. But the question is, who would you rather have? An authentic relationship with yourself or an inauthentic relationship with others? And basically, the good news is that the more authentic you become, the more you'll find relationships that can respect that authenticity. So you're not going to be left all alone. But it can be painful at times in this society where we're all expected to be other than who we are. How did you transform your relationship like with your past? You mentioned that there was a point where you were pretty bitter about what happened. And I think a lot of people, they get hardened, you know, on the outside because of what's happened to them in their past that they, they just feel so much anger. Like, what are a few things that, that really helped you soften up when it came to that? Well, it certainly wasn't an event. It was a process that took, I'm sort of thick headed. So for me, it took decades, you know? And, uh, and even after I was well appreciated out there in the world as a healer and author and so on, even after that, I had trouble shifting my own perspective on myself, you know? So that was a process that involved at some point therapy. It certainly involved my relationship with my wife because we, we tend to carry our hurts and our limit, self-limiting beliefs, our resentments into our closest relationships. And we tend to make our partners responsible for making us happy and basically i'm saying to my wife take away my wounds would you and if you don't it's your fault you know that was my attitude for a long time i tell you it doesn't quite work you know so ultimately you have to learn to take responsibility for your own wounds and your own beliefs and my relationship has been a powerful school ground for that learning so the relationship therapy all the reading that i've done the work that i've done with others psychedelic medicines have been of self-help to me as well so spiritual work taking care of my body so it doesn't drag me down, you know? Like I can hardly wait to finish this conversation, not because I don't want the conversation, because, but because I get to go for a swim afterwards, you know? And for me, swimming is just like a real meditative, releasing exercise, you know? So it took a lot and it continues to take an effort, you know, and an effort in a very positive sense. So if somebody's stuck in old patterns, there's no reason to despair. I mean, it feels painful and difficult, but the possibility of healing is present all the time. Yeah, it's so true. And thanks for opening up and, and sharing all that. And I think that like, we just have to have compassion for ourselves and also like the self-awareness of where things aren't going well in our lives. And then knowing that, you know, it is possible to change these things and that it's going to take quite some time because a lot of this stuff has been ingrained in us for, for decades, perhaps. And a lot of it we didn't really realize was bugging us until, you know, maybe recently. And 
along those same lines, some great tips, and I'm sure the audience is going to appreciate that. How do you feel, like, where's the line with coddling and, like, tough love when it comes to kids? Because I hear a lot of people talk about now that, you know, kids should be able to experience some levels of stress as they get older and adversity so that they can develop healthy coping mechanisms for when they're adults. Like, what's your take on that? Well, first of all, there's no such thing as tough love. There's either tough or there's love, but there's no such thing as tough love. By tough love, they usually mean punishment and rejection, which is unhealthy. That's the first point. Discipline. We want to teach our kids discipline. Yes, we do. We don't want to teach it to them. We want them to develop discipline. But let's look at that word discipline. What's a disciple? Well, who follows you, yeah? Why did Jesus' disciples follow him? Because he loved them, and they loved him. Kids, if we love them, they will follow us. They'll be our disciples. We don't have to force them into anything. It's the quality of their relationship and how gentle we are with them. Now, as to coddling kids, let them experience the stresses of life. Believe me, they will. That's how life is. We don't have to add extra stress to their lives by punishing them. They're going to have disappointments. Their friends will not want to play with them one day. Their cat will die. They may break a leg. They will lose a beloved object. Mom or dad may get sick. Their best friend may move away to a different town. These are the inevitable stresses of life. We don't have to impose stresses on kids. What we have to do is to help them cope with the stresses that naturally arise. That's not cuddling. That's just when a kid has grief because their best friend moved away, you hold them and you say, that really sad is, that's really sad. That makes you feel sad, doesn't it? You don't buy them a toy to make them feel better. You let them have their sadness, but you support them in that sadness. So parents who cuddle their kids, try and protect them, try and bribe them, they're not helping their kids. But neither are parents helping their kids who punish their kids or who force their kids to suppress their natural emotions. Yeah. Some great points. And I think what you said is spot on. Like you don't want to try to fix their problem. You want to support them through the problem so they can get used to having support and asking for support when they're going through hard times. The last question I want to ask as we kind of bring things somewhat full circle is I think a lot of the the problems that we create for ourselves, whether it's using substances to numb pain, whether it's, you know, escaping by, you know, staying on our phones too long or being in the wrong relationships or whatever the case is, it's because we're like afraid of being with ourselves and we're afraid of being ourselves and we're disconnected from who we are and we're lost. What are some ways that if somebody's listening to this and they, they feel like they're afraid of being themselves or feeling disconnected from their true self, how can they get back to that level of authenticity? Well, first of all, if I'm afraid to be with myself, there's a good reason for it. It's because when I was going through difficult stuff as an infant or a small child, I was left totally alone. And for the child, those states of fear or emotional pain are unbearable. Therefore, we fear being with ourselves. We always try and distract ourselves somehow, whatever that is, music or a book or some restless activity or television or talking to people or, you know, but that fear of being with ourselves, that's a sign of trauma. So first of all, don't make yourself wrong for it, but understand that that too has a source in your life and try to understand your story, why you might have developed that fear of yourself. And realize, and this takes meditation, it takes work, it takes body work, whatever it takes, that you're not that child anymore. That when you get triggered, if you learn what that's all about, you'll learn that you can actually handle that emotion. So it's okay for my wife to say no, and I might say, okay, I'm disappointed, but I don't have to put myself and her through a big stressful drama because I'm still telling myself that I'm an abandoned infant, you know? So we need to strive to get into the present moment as much as possible. That may take spiritual work, that may take body work, that may take therapy, but it can be done. It might take connecting with nature, which is always present, but um, it can be done. Yeah, such great advice. And I think, you know, a lot of times what happens is it's during the moments where we are most afraid of being by ourselves that we actually need it the most. And that's like when some of the greatest levels of growth come is when you spend time in that discomfort and you get outside in nature and you start to learn more about yourself so that you can start to understand like you know not just some things that you're unhappy with with yourself or what some things that may have happened to you that you are angry about but more like what you like about yourself what you love about yourself and what you want to do moving forward so dr mate this has been awesome 
I wanted to thank you so much for your time once again. I really enjoyed this conversation. I think people are going to get a lot of value out of it. Obviously, you got your latest book, The Myth of Normal, New York Times bestseller. Congrats on that. And if people want to check out your work, if they want to buy any of your books, follow you online, where's the best place to do that? Well, I don't sell any anything myself, but many dozens of my talks on YouTube, I didn't put them up there, but people did. Some have been seen by millions of people. So check my name on YouTube. You can hear me blather away in all kinds of topics endlessly, if you wish. There are five books of mine. Next week, two of them, this coming weekend, two of them will be on the New York Times bestsellers list, including The Myth of Normal and my book on ADHD, Scattered Minds. There's my website, Dr. Gabor Mate. There are organizations that have filmed me and they sell courses based on my work or, you know, featuring me. One is called wholehearted.org. The other is Psychotherapy Networker. These sounds true. These organizations have all filmed courses with me that are available. Compassionate Inquiry. There's something called Compassionate Inquiry Short Course, which is not for professionals. It's for the layperson. It's it's not expensive, and it sort of goes into my teachings around trauma and healing. And then, then again, there are my books. So, you know, there's lots of ways to get a hold of my work if people are interested.